Well, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Ruth chapter 1. Today we're going to be looking at the first five verses of this fantastic book. As we went through an introduction last week, we read the whole first chapter and then just gave uh, summaries uh, of, of many of the themes and how it's the story that's within a bigger story, uh, especially the story of the gospel and how there is such a beautiful orchestration of God's sovereign hand, also grace and kindness as this whole thing gets aligned with literally the lineage of Jesus Christ. And so it really is a beautiful story and it's worth looking at in detail. So again, I hope we're not going to get into, and so you can pray for me in this, not, I don't want to strain any gnats, as they may say, I don't want to be overly repetitive on any themes. And yet I hope that we are able to see the main thrust of each and every passage and where it leans us into the gospel. Okay, because again, remember, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remember that the New Testament is not God's plan B. Remember that every other effort of God's did not fail only for him to simply put the palm to the forehead and go, now what am I going to do? And then Jesus says, I'll go. It's not like that. Everything is orchestrated and aligned by God according to the word so that we see clearly that Jesus Christ alone is sufficient to save, only. And so as we see then a historical event like we see with Ruth, we get to see some gritty details, some realities, some humanity in the midst of this larger story that I think is important for us to both see and understand for the sake of the larger narrative, but also in a sense, see ourselves in that story. And so what we're going to look at today is, is simply the setting, the setup. We're essentially going to talk about the time period that this took place, the places of significance that are, that are associated with Ruth, some decisions of great consequence that occurred, but also great loss. There's great loss. Even in the first five verses, we essentially see how the circumstances, the situation, and some decisions led to incredible loss. None of it outside of God's purview. It certainly would raise a lot of questions. And even though we know the end of the story, we're going to allow ourselves to sit a little bit longer under this loss. Okay? That doesn't mean that we're going to end this, this message with something of a downer. Uh, we're definitely going to be pointing, pointing ahead to what we see in this book. But I want you to understand this because we live in a fallen world. Even yesterday, surprisingly, someone goes to get milk and eggs and literally their world is turned upside down at the hands of a rampant racist just at the young age of 18 years old. Something, someone, some community turned him this way, but all they did was feed and fuel fallenness that was already in him. We are born fallen people. One thing, too, that I think will come through in this today, I hope, and it's a bit of a, a teaser of what's coming up in uh, a, a couple of points. There's really not a lot said at the very, in these first verses, and actually really the whole of the, the book about the cause for the famine, or whether or not it was sinful for Elimelech to lead his family out of Jerusalem into Moab. I'm going to paint a picture that leans into, I believe it was fear that either, you know, honestly, fear either leads us to deeper faith. It's something that sometimes God uses. It's not always the opposite of faith, but a lot of times fear can lead us into trusting what we see away from faith and therefore into sin and disobedience. So as we look at this, I want you to consider two things as we move along. The decisions that he made leading into consequence that Elimelech in taking Naomi and the two sons over into Moab, one thing I want you to think about is, is the absence of there being a declaration of why these things occurred, why the famine was occurring, and whether or not it was sinful, is it because that cause is not all that important for the truths that we're to gain out of the book of Ruth? Or is it because it should be so obvious because Scripture already speaks to these things. 
Now, I don't want to spend too much time there because that's a little bit behind the scenes. But I do think we have a tendency to try to do a cafeteria style when it comes to our circumstances, what put us in a situation. Instead of seeing what's been there for a couple of millennia, just written in the scriptures as far as what is faithful and what is sinful. But we want to so make it about our current cultural situational circumstance that we go, well, that really didn't apply because my situation's different. Sometimes the cause of our plight should be more obvious than it is. A lot of times we are scrambling for reasons for why we are struggling because we don't want to face what is right in front of us, which is the word of God has said, we're not being faithful. Again, don't want to spend too much time there, but I want you to consider it as we read this language. So let's read verses one through five. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And one thing you'll see later as well, that 10 years, those women, those Moabite women, neither gave birth to grandchildren. There was a barrenness, as we introduced last week. Let's first of all talk about this time of judges. I think this is important for us to understand the context. Now, as as we've already had read in Judges chapter 2, which is a great introduction to what the judges are all about. Let me also, if you book in, in fact, if you, perhaps yours, your Bible is like mine, where Ruth is on one page and the very end of Judges on the other. If you take a look at verse 25, the very last verse of the book of Judges, look at what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, the period of the judges lasted about 300 years-ish. 300 years. And essentially, it was like this. The people of God were faithless. God would bring in an an enemy, usually ended with ites, Edomites, some other kind of thing like that. And he would use those enemies to try to bring them to repentance, and they wouldn't. And then God, in his pity, would raise up a judge. So, for instance, like Samson. Okay? Or my favorite, Shamgar. I love that name. And he only has one verse. It only says that Shamgar did the same, basically, and delivered them. It's it's like all he says, because with a name like that, do you really need any other detail? Because you know the dude's got like swords and shields and a huge arsenal. I love Shamgar. Jan's lucky. Jonathan, it is so good that we named you Jonathan because there's other names because Shamgar was right on the, it was on the table, man. But Then what God would do in raising up these judges would then deliver them from the very enemies that God allowed to be raised up against his people. Now for us as pragmatists, we go, wow, that seems like you're really going around the corner to try to get to the main point. But God in his kindness, whatever, and God wasn't doing a whatever it takes because God's means matters. So the purposes of God in raising up enemies, okay, including Moab, So keep that in your pocket, was to bring them to repentance. And then when that did not work, and again, he would know whether or not this would work, just like in dealing with Moses, what happened to Pharaoh? He said, Moses, go to him. But every time he gave Moses this incredibly, just incredibly motivational speech, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh and I'm going to harden his heart. (laughs) Okay. And as much of that was about uh, Moses' faithfulness in going, regardless, not so much about changing Pharaoh's mind. It's something only God could do. 
So in this course, in this cycle, we still see the same thing over and over and over again for 300 something years. They did what was right in their own eyes. And at the end, you know what it shows? They were looking for a king. So you know who comes after this? Saul. Now, eventually we get David out of the deal. But we get Saul because they rushed. We get Saul because they had a very nationalistic perspective of what the kingdom of God looked like. And God had been trying to grip their heart for his kingdom, to be his people of his covenant, to be faithful according to his laws. And they were not. In Judges 10 verse 6, it says, The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. If you go back in Judges, uh, one of the earlier um, enemies was Moab in in Judges 3, starting in verse 12, you'll see where the Moabites actually held Israel in captivity for about 18 years. If you jump forward in verse 11, you see them show up yet again. They're always lingering as those who are against Israel, often raised up by God to, in a a sense, teach Israel a lesson, and yet then would be delivered by a judge. Basically, not allies. They weren't friends. They were antagonists over and over and over again. This is the time period that Ruth is happening. We don't know where in that almost 300 years that that all the time of the judges is going on. We definitely know that whoever wrote it, wrote it understanding that it was leading to David. So it was written later, but as far as when it all occurred, I'm guessing it was the latter half of of that period, but we don't know. But it was during that time. So there's a lot of very clear, distinct judgment, correction, discipline going on of God's people. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. All right, so let's talk about the the places of significance that are in this story as we continue with this setting. So the time was the judges, but where are they coming out of? They're coming out of a place called Bethlehem. Now you, I mean, we know it, right? You know Bethlehem. It's just south of Jerusalem, uh, not very far really at all. You know this to be the birthplace of Christ. Micah 5.2 prophesies that out of Bethlehem, Ephrathah is going to come the ruler, is going to come the God-man, is going to come the, the deliverer. So Bethlehem we know to be a pretty significant place. And even when he speaks of them being Ephrathites, simply that means, that doesn't mean they're foreigners, it simply means they're of the clan in some form or fashion of Ephraim. It's just specifying kind of their family clan, but also location-wise where they're from, Bethlehem. It's significant. It's significant that we have this connection because Ruth makes it significant that they fall in the line of David. And the New Testament then quotes it and in referencing how Ruth shows up. Ruth, who is not a Jew, shows up in the line of Jesus Christ. This is a place of significance because Naomi and Elimelech, they are Jews. They are of the house of Ephraim. They are from Bethlehem, and yet they leave. Where do they go? Well, they go to the other significant place that we've already mentioned in part, Moab. Moab is east of Bethlehem. If we had a map, if if you're looking at me, like... I'll just say I'm the Dead Sea. So if I'm the Dead Sea and you have over here, you have Bethlehem, Jerusalem, you're going to go over me, the Dead Sea, over here, and there's some mountains. Really should have done a graphic. Sorry, Rich. (laughs) Okay. Um, And then over here is Moab. So basically, you actually could on a clear day, if you were up in the hills just east of Jerusalem, you could get up there, look over the Dead Sea, and see the mountains that are right there at the border of Moab. I mean, it really was that kind of view. What's interesting is Moab, the Moabites, they're actually descendants of Lot. So if you remember, you have Abram, you have Lot, they go their different ways. Lot was a mess, right? I mean, Lot was, even though he was um, of that connection with Abraham, 
he, he made a mess of decisions over and over, over again. And, and God still was kind and delivered him, but he also always was trying to carve out the better land and the better flocks. He was very selfish in his perspectives, and yet, you know, God still used him. But basically, the people then led from there. So there, there was always basically even this familial jealousy of God's hand on Abram or Abraham. And so the people of Lot come, the people of Moab come out of this because that's the land that he settles in. It's interesting. The only reason I mention it is not because it necessarily in some caste system kind of way locks people into being a certain way. Simply this, it's all part of God's orchestration and what he is doing to show his redemption. Because the fact is, there has to be an antagonist for there to be deliverance. God has decided, God has seen fit. I don't get it, I don't fully understand, but God has seen fit that what glorifies him the most is showing redemption. Showing redemption up against his holiness and the fact that he can judge all and none should be saved. The fact that he extends mercy to any is most glorious to him. So you have Bethlehem, you have Moab. But then you have decisions that led from one to the other. Now, this is what I was hinting at a little bit earlier. So here, there's a famine in the land. So there's a famine in Bethlehem, right? And with this famine, they hear that there is provision, there is grain, there are jobs and there's grain over in Moab. So they leave. It's a pretty good trek because, again, you have to go over me to get there. It's over the Dead Sea. And so as you do that... They put themselves in a position of, do they trust God to remain, which you don't see, faith, or do they bank on what they do here and think they will see to fit the need? Now, Elimelech is, is making the call here because he's leading his family. And it's hard to fault him because there is a mandate for us to make sure that there is a provision going on, and especially in their society, for there to be provision going on. But I at least want to present to you Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 17. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Just go left and find Deuteronomy. Find chapter 11 and verses 13 through 17. This decision is made to leave Jerusalem or to leave Bethlehem, to leave Judah because of a famine and to go to a foreign land, a land that during the time of Judges was used to actually judge Israel, a land that had false gods, a land that was an enemy of Israel in order to feed your family. And again, because it's not explicit, I can't fully say this was an act of faithlessness. But all I can do is read to you the text. Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13 through 17 says this. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today the lo to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care, lest your heart be deceived. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. Even though there's a context for when we get the law and these statements, these conditional statements of God's blessing to Israel, it's not stated as if it's confined to that context. What I mean is it's coming just on the heels of the Ten Commandments. These are rules and laws and conditional statements that are made that are be, to be kept. There's no end point. There's no time period to these things. And he is saying, if you will follow me, then I will make sure you're taken care of. But if you go after other gods, and what did we already read in the Judges? Over and over again, because they didn't have a king, they kept going after other gods. Why? Because they saw foreign nationals, again, that nationalistic, that earthly mentality of a kingdom, they saw those kingdoms thrive. 
And here he has said that if you do allow yourself to be deceived and go after other gods, I will shut things down. You'll see why I lean into the reason the famine exists is because of the disobedience of Israel. And therefore, to run after nations that seem to be flourishing, but under deception is probably not such a good idea. But again, Ruth doesn't say explicitly, I'm just putting together a little bit of the context of Judges going back to Deuteronomy. Now, also this. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, go back just a couple of pages if you're still in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. So they sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, husband, died, um, and she was left with her two sons. And then the two sons took Moabite wives. Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Now, let me say very, very quickly and very, very distinctly, this has nothing to do with interracial marriage. This has to do with marrying into a culture where you would end up being deceived and fall into the worship of false gods. Okay, if you, if you want to challenge me on that, I would be happy to prove to you that Moses married a Cushat woman who was a black woman. And I will also tell you that Marian, Marian who is uh, Moses' sister, when she was upset that he married essentially a black woman from Cush, that um, God gave her leprosy. So God really hates racism, okay? So this is not about interracial marriage. This is about marrying into a culture that is worshiping a false God. This is more in kind with you marrying someone who does not know Christ. This is more in kind with you going into a relationship with someone who actually then is an atheist or someone who goes after other gods even themselves. There's a couple of big decisions going on in just the first five verses that look like these are opposed to what's going on with God, what God has established for his people. Going to a land that worships false gods because they have food, leaving your own land because the reason there's famine is because there is a faithlessness in the land, but God still cares for his people. Now, again, with that absence of it being declared, here's what's beautiful about this. Even though that all sounds very harsh and very rigid, we still know how this story works out. Ruth, a Moabite woman who initially was a believer in false gods, states that after all this loss, that Naomi is going to be her, in a sense, spiritual mother, and she is resolute in worshiping the one God of Israel in the course of it, essentially her conversion experience, and she is in the line of Christ, a Moabite woman. So again, I don't want to speculate, did Elimelech die because of his disobedience? Did the sons die because of their disobedience in marrying foreign women who worship false gods? I'm not saying that, but I'm also not not saying that. What I do want us to make sure we focus on, though, is this whole book is about redemption and grace. And it always, always, all of our situations, all of our stories have a backdrop of some kind of loss. Which brings us to this next point. There, this is a period of great loss, specifically for Naomi. Now, Naomi's name means my delight. There is almost nothing in the setup of this story that is delightful. But that's what her name means. Delight. Now, I'm not going to spend almost any time on this, but I do think it's worth noting. It is very significant that we have a book, one of 66, that is essentially devoted where the central figures are women in a strongly patriarchal society. I'm not saying that for social purposes or anything else. I'm just saying that God in what he does in his work is so beautifully, holistically redemptive for any and all that come to him, including foreigners including exiles. 
It's not nice and tidy. It is messy, and out of it comes an incredible beauty that would not be beautiful otherwise. She had a loss of home. There was famine. She left. I mean, she was an Ephrathite from Bethlehem. That is literally where Ephraim, Ephraim uh, settled. And so she had deep roots in Bethlehem. And they had to leave because of the famine. Had to, you know, based on whatever choice. But they, they left. She had to follow the lead of her husband. And they leave. She lost home right off the bat. For whatever the reason, again, as I posited earlier, because it doesn't say this, is it because the points in Ruth don't matter as far as the cause, or is it because the cause of their leaving is so obvious because Scripture has already said clearly, there's famine in the land because of faithlessness, don't leave and go to foreign lands with foreign gods and intermarry. And yet that's exactly what they do. Could it be that their whole family ends up being the beauty of what God does that even in the face of disobeying almost exactly according to the book of Judges and yet God doing something redemptively beautiful in the midst of it. Is that possible? Is it possible that Ruth in following up Judges is an intimate, beautiful narrative, example, historical event of a family to show us just how redemptive God is, not just to those who are from his tribe, which would be Naomi, but also to a Moabite woman who ends up being in the line of Jesus Christ. She had the loss of her husband. Elimelech's name is my God is king. Now, if he chose in faithlessness to run out of fear to go to a foreign land, then there's irony in his name, right? But here's what we need to know for Naomi's loss. To lose a husband in that society at that time was the equivalent of becoming homeless. So don't think about our society. Don't think about even in the church where we are commanded to give great deferment to widows and to care for them well. Now, there is some backdrop, though, and that's why she gets pressed back into Judah. Because in Moab... There was no provision for a widow. There was no provision for a widow outside of her sons, and she had none. She lost everything. The only provision, there was some conditional, and it wasn't really necessarily law, and we'll dive into this later when we get to Boaz, but there were some conditional obligations that family members could care and should care for the widows of you know, a brother or a cousin that actually um, died and to care for that wife. And that's what we end up seeing with Boaz, but not to go there just yet. But there was no provision for her. This loss was catastrophic. It was not just losing a husband. It was not just losing children. It literally was losing hope of survival. Now she was working. She was out in the fields gathering grain This is where she gets wind of something happening back in Jerusalem, back in Bethlehem, that God had been showing up, God had been providing just 10 years later. I do wonder, I do wonder if Naomi in the chorus just wondered, oh, I wish we had stayed. But we have the story, so we're going to, we're going to ride it all the way out. The loss of children. Malon and Chilion. Again, don't want to speculate as to the cause of death. I think there's a, there's a little bit of evidence that there could be some kind of, you know, genetic issues with them both. I mean, mainly because their, their names. Um, Malon's name actually means sickly. Might be an indicator. Um, and uh, Chilion's was basically uh, puny or pining um, or consumption. Uh, and, and, you know, in old school days, like even in the early 20th century, a lot of times they would, you know, they had no other words for certain deaths. And they would just say they died by consumption. Basically, y- your life is just wasting away. I-, I tried to look and find, you know, something more concrete on when did they name children? At what point did they, because this seems pretty, I mean, it's really not inspiring you to work out and try to make the varsity team if your name is sickly. There's probably not a lot of self-esteem going on in the playground because you are definitely getting picked last because the teacher makes you. 
Pick sickly. He needs to be on your team. No, I'll take puny. Great. It just didn't bode too well for these guys. I tend to think that there was something there, but again, we don't know. But one thing that I do think is important that Naomi must have had a suspicion. Can you imagine the fear of leaving homeland where there is the possibility of care when essentially she's probably seeing a sick husband and definitely has children that may not look like they're going to make it in this society too long. And they're going to a foreign land where they're basically going to be treated like slaves just so they can eat. So this loss of provision ends up becoming paramount. There's no provision for her situation in Moab. And so she is pressed back to go back to Judah, to go back to Bethlehem and maybe find hope through family members. But here's the thing. Here's the wild thing about this. She still isn't left alone. She feels very alone. She feels very abandoned. For all we know, she feels very distant even from God because there was some complaining that we'll see in this chapter and into the second chapter about some complaints she had about God. But God provides for her a couple of sweet enemies in Orpah and Ruth. And we'll deal more later with with this, I'll simply tell you this, that Orpah means gazelle. I don't know if that's because as a baby, she really was one of those that you didn't have to say, oh, what a beautiful baby. And you're just, it's not a beautiful baby. I hope they grow up and grow out of that. Um, but more, I don't know, because that was often at times in the Old Testament, a, a, a word picture of someone that was beautiful, a gazelle. I've never tried that one with Jan 28 years in. I might at some point if I really run out of other things. But Ruth, however, means friendly and kindness. And I love that because that's absolutely what we see in her the rest of this story. But I guess if anything, that's what I want you to know. In the midst of all this that we've talked about with this, the timing and the setting and the decisions that were made and all of the loss is that still after it's all said and done, you're still not alone. Now, this isn't necessarily the, the band of sisters that she would have loved to have had around her, but she's not alone. And what becomes really surprising is through an enemy, through a foreigner, through a Moabite comes the redemption and salvation that Naomi longed for in the first place. And she doesn't see it yet. This is why we can trust that God in not leaving us alone has a plan. And he'll see that plan through. It's still messy. It's still painful. Nobody gets resurrected from the dead here. There's no occurrence where we see Naomi, you know, where she gets married again and ends up having all these, you know, wonderful things given to her. No. You are not alone. God raises up others around you. You are not alone. There is a hand of providence going on in and around you. Even in the backdrop of not knowing why you're in the circumstances you're in. Maybe it is because of your fear leading you to faithlessness and sin. God is still doing something. Or even if it's more a result of someone else's sin, if it was Elimelech who was disobedient, Naomi had to go along for the ride. And it still produced some bitterness in her. You are not alone What we see is, what you will end up seeing is that God's word ends up showing and proving God's providence through this story. Look, if you're joining us online or if you're here for the first time or maybe just even as a Christian, you are needing to be reminded of this. The New Testament says that it is appointed for man wants to die and then the judgment. Christ is that judge. There is coming a time when the time of judges will come back and it will be Jesus and Jesus alone. And everyone will give an account. Instead of leaving Bethlehem, he came out of Bethlehem and in the course of this made a decision at Gethsemane to submit himself to whatever the Lord's providential hand had for him to experience all of the loss greater than what Naomi even experienced. 
because she was never truly alone. Christ, however, for a moment was completely abandoned on the cross. He experienced great loss. Why? So that you would not be alone, so that you would have an eternal home. Not just to make it back to Judah and be taken care of and be provided for, but to have a heavenly home. And if you do not see that Christ experienced all of that loss on your behalf, you will eternally experience homelessness away from him and in a place among the enemies, in a place of constant judgment. Come to Christ. We have a story that is visceral, that is human, that is beautiful, but it does remind us of something eternal. So whatever the reason you have, the plight that you're in, if you're a Christian and you just need to be reminded of hope, look, she was without anyone else to care for her, so she needed a community. God has given us through the New Testament, that community is the church. Humble yourself and say, I need help. You're in a desperate situation. Come to the church to help you. Perhaps you are bitter at your circumstances. Remember that God is going to do a work that points to Christ. And if you are without Christ and you are a foreigner, remember there are those who really are and really do love you. Maybe you have a distaste for Christians. And as you'll see in the coming weeks, Naomi wanted them to stay with their, their own families. Wanted Orpah, and Orpah does go, but Ruth does not, to be taken care of in this world. But the Lord used Ruth, a foreigner, to remind her that it's not about everything just in this world. Oh, let your curiosity be piqued. Keep coming and searching and looking and listening and questioning and find out, does he have a place for me? I can tell you that if you come to him and confess your sin and confess that you believe that he died in your place, I promise you that he does because he's promised you that he does. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Father, I want to thank you for the reminder in your word that you have not left us alone. That even though we experience a story here that is filled with so much loss and tragedy, it is the backdrop of one of the most beautiful, redemptive works in a family's life that we possibly could see or witness. And yet it still falls short of the redemption that you offer through Jesus Christ. And God, it is not lost on us that what you're doing here in this story does have echoes and even in a, geolo- in, a, in a biological sense, in a lineage sense, in an ancestral sense, it literally leads to Christ, but it also points to Christ in so many of these elements. And God, I pray that you might remind some even today that even if they are experiencing loss because of their sin, I pray that they would confess their sin, return to you, or if they do not know you, to come to you for the first time and profess you to be the only one that can care for them. And to be part of your people, of a local church, that we might share and show that kingdom of heaven while here in a foreign place, in a fallen place, while we wait for you to come. And in the meantime, that we would proclaim with kindness and hospitality and graciousness and bold declaration of the gospel to a lost community and world to join, to be part, to find hope. May your will be done as it is in heaven. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.